welcome back to Knee Sports. Today we're talking about Chelsea and it's not about Chelsea on the pitch, it's Chelsea off the pitch. And we're going to be delving into their two window transfer ban and the reasons for that. Um, before we go any further make sure you hit the like, share and subscribe button and we're going to get into this, we're going to get in deep. Now, FIFA's released a report, um, a 44 page document. Basically, all their findings on why Chelsea have been banned from making transfers. Now, we know back in February, they were banned for two transfer windows of the summer and January from making any transfers, meaning that um, Pulis Pulisic was their last player, the last player to be registered. For Chelsea now they had players who were on loan such as Higuain and Kovacic who they could have kept on um, as permanent transfers if they wish Higuain of course they let go back to Juventus um, but they kept on Kovacic but Pulisic was the last registered player he was one who they signed in January um, and he obviously started at the club registered this year but they've been prevented from registering any other um, players and there was a lot of question marks in the in the summer leading up to the transfer window well why don't they appeal because we've seen in the past a few Spanish clubs I think or Atletico Madrid, Barcelona I believe Real Madrid as well um, they were banned by FIFA they appealed were able to make transfers in that summer um, and then when their appeal failed then the ban will kick in but by then they'd already made the necessary arrangements. Chelsea, um, funnily enough, and we'll get on to why it's a bit ironic, they, they didn't appeal. Um, they, they, they've they appealed whether or not it should be a two-window two, two window ban, so they, they've, they're trying to get the one in January lifted, but they didn't appeal uh, for the ban to be overturned. Uh, appealing for the ban to be overturned would have probably put the whole thing on hold um, until that case was heard, would mean they would have been been able to make uh, transfers in the summer <clears throat> and people question why why they should why why haven't they the reality is they had so many and they have so many players on their books out on loan in the youth system etc etc that if one team could cope with a transfer ban or two then it's probably Chelsea because they've got more players away from the club, out of the club, probably, then they got in the club. So if there's one team who could really cope with it, um, it would be Chelsea. And so far they are coping with it. They're doing well in the league. Um, Lampard's looks like he's got a good thing going there. You know, I'm not going to get too ahead, in this, too ahead of myself, but going well in the league, uh, going well in the Champions League, top of their group, of course, just got knocked out of the, the League Cup, but I'm sure that wasn't one of his main priorities this season. Um, and so they're proving that you know, they are able to cope with it. You would think it would say the likes of Manchester United or um, I say Spurs. Spurs have had a, <laughs> seemed like they had a transfer ban for the longest while. But Arsenal, for example, teams that need rebuilding and just don't have the strength within the, the, the squad, the setup that Chelsea do and um, have got, they would, have, they would have struggled, really struggled, even more so than they are this season already with that transfer ban. So Chelsea were able to Look like, look like they may be able to ride this one out. But like I said, they're still trying to get that January ban overturned, um, which means that Lampard may be able to delve in into the market in the summer. But we'll go into the article now. Um, uh, so, Chelsea says, Chelsea breached 150 rules involving 71 young players, which led to their two-window transfer ban. Uh, one child appeared in 75 games over three years despite only being registered for 18 weeks. Now we had 150 breaches, 71 players, average of you know just over two breaches per player. That's a, that's a systematic issue there at the club. It's not, you know, oh, we made, an issue, we made a mistake, you know, we, 
forgot to register this person, or someone was ineligible. That's systematic. 150 breaches, 71 players. That's a systematic plan of, of basically trying to bypass the rules that FIFA have put in place. Um, article, article goes, says, Chelsea did not register a number of youth players over several seasons. A report from FIFA um, confirmed today. The Premier League club were unable to sign players in the summer due to the mishandling and January. Um, due to the mishandle of player registrations. Um, despite breaching 150 rules, that the Chelsea have only been sanctioned uh, for 27 of them. So that when you, when you pay 150, when I heard 150, I'm thinking, and they only got a one season ban, 150. But like I said, they've only been sanctioned for 27. So. Maybe, maybe <laughs> they argue their way out of the, the other 123 or so. The full file is released in a 44 page document by FIFA showed a number of games unregistered youth team members played and in doing so dismissed Chelsea's defence against the rule breaches. One unnamed player turned out 75 times for the club between 2013 and 2016, despite being registered as a trialist for just 18 weeks. Bertrand Traore, the Burkina Faso striker who is now at Lyon, played for three years at the club before his eventual registration in 2014. Chelsea claimed the games referred to were training matches. <laughs> However, FIFA dismissed this that out of hand, saying the committee has no doubt the matches referred to were organised under the auspices of the FA. The panel also added Chelsea explained trials for overseas players will consist of three or four visits lasting up to three weeks. But several players actually spent a significant amount of time with Chelsea, considerably higher than the one suggested. Players were also taking part in organised football without being registered this type of conduct cannot be tolerated. Now, of course, there's rules regarding play registration of, of teenagers, people under a certain age, under the age of 18. And by not registering them, but having them in and around the club, it gives Chelsea somewhat of a, a advantage to rivals because you're able to, to bring these youngsters over, not register them, but they're still affiliated with the club. So when they do turn, when they are at the, the appropriate age where you can then register them, you've already got them. You've already, you're not competing with anyone because they're already within your, your setup. Um, I said Bertrand Traoré was there for three years before he registered in 2014. So anyone, let's say, thinking, oh, oh let's look at that Bertrand Traoré person in 2014. He's been with Chelsea for three years. He's not going anywhere. And as I said, this didn't happen just once. If this kind of thing is happening time and, um, over and over again, you see it's a clear plan. And no wonder Chelsea are dominating all the youth, um, you know, FA Cup tournaments and all the youth are out there in the championship and, and the different leagues getting experience. And now they've come back. I'm not saying these players per se, but when you've got so many young players on your books, it's, a, it's, it's no surprise when, you know, let's say five or six of them make the grade you know you, you build up a such a um a portfolio of young players that some of them are going to make the grade so obviously chelsea they, they they've been using their youth academy as uh for financial gain more than on the pitch until recently until now now we know there was always the, you know the odd one player here or there who burst through, but right now, and you know, partly due to the transfer ban, partly due to Lampard's uh, philosophy and a willingness to give youth a chance, we're seeing a crop of young players uh, now blossoming and coming through. But as I said, if you know, if you're, if seventy-one players have been, let's say, acquired illegally, then it's no surprise if you know, five to ten of them over that period of time turn out to, to be quality and can make the grade at this level.
Um, so they're giving themselves an unfair advantage. I mean, punish duly. Um, as I said, they have appealed, but they've yet to receive a date uh, for their for their tr uh, appeal court date against that ban. One of the issues or the breaches for Chelsea was that of third party ownership. Now, the Premier League, we know, well, we know from experience that third party ownership is illegal in uh, the Premier League. It may well be in England as a whole, but definitely in the Premier League. We had a massive case what, back in 2007 with uh, the signings of Carlos Tevez and Javier Mascherano by West Ham um, through their agent, is it Kia Jarab Kim, I believe his name is, um, and the agency they were tied to and West Ham purchased, him Ill purchased them sorry, illegally and as a result, uh, Sheffield United took them to court and they won a financial settlement, but ultimately they were relegated from the Premier League. West Ham stayed up through the contributions of more, more so Carlos Tevez than uh, Javier Mascherano. And it's, it's really from that case that brought to light you know, this issue about third party ownership, which is very common um, in Europe, South America. So it's a, how a lot of European clubs, Spanish clubs, uh, generally they purchase a lot of players from South America on a on a part part ownership deal. But the Premier League say that the club has to hundred percent own all the rights for that player. Um, but Chelsea have were found to breach. I think I believe it was two. Yeah, two players who were controlled by a club uh, in the third party agreement. So, Billy Gilmore, obviously he made his, I don't know if it was his debut. No, it wasn't his debut because he played against Grimsby in the last round. But he played against Manchester United yesterday in the Carabao Cup. Um, and the article says, Chelsea's transfer conduct involving wonder kid Billy Gilmore was one of two examples of third party ownership that led the Premier League club being handed a two window transfer ban. Uh, says FIFA have released findings dating back to Chelsea's failed appeal against the ban, which have revealed that the English outfit entered a third party agreement with Rangers involving the 18 year old. It has emerged uh, that Gilmore was one of two players who FIFA determined were controlled by Chelsea are still on the books at other clubs. The midfielder joined the Blues from Rangers officially in August 2017, but in May of the same year, the clubs agreed that the Scottish Giants could not sell or loan Gilmore to any other clubs without the consent of Chelsea. The agreement also stated that at any point, the player could be released to train with Chelsea and play in friendly games whenever they pleased. The Gilmore case was also accompanied by findings that Chelsea had made a similar arrangement with Ajax over Juan Carlos Familla Castillo, who is currently alone with the Dutch club. Rangers were fined 7800 for their part in the Gilmore agreement. Um, so yeah, it's, it's clear from that, from that report. If Chelsea's got control over whether the guy can, who the guy's going to play for, at any specific time, whether he can go on loan or not, where, who he trains with, whether, whichever way you want to spin it, he clearly is partly owned by Chelsea, whichever way you want to spin it. I don't know what the papers and the contracts look like and you know how they try to get around it, but if that is an agreement between you and a club, to that extent, then clearly you partly own that player. You control partly the, the rights and the freedom and movement of work of that player. And then when you add, as I said, that, that's one or there's just two cases, obviously the um, Castillo over in uh, Ajax, Plus all the other cases in terms of register, or not even registering, not registering players under the age uh, which is allowed by
But playing for Chelsea for a longer period than you know a trial date or any of those uh, smaller time periods, clearly being on within Chelsea setup, but not officially registering them. When you add all that together, you might say a, a, a one-year ban, a two-window ban is uh, is is insufficient. Because this isn't the first time. Chelsea had an issue with Gil Kakuta back in 2013. Was that 2013? Back in back, I think it was about back in about 2013. The issue with Gil Kakuta. They've had issues with John Obi Mikel. When we when well, when we Manchester United actually signed him from uh, Linoslo, and somehow he ended up at Chelsea in that same summer that we signed him. Chelsea have a history of underhand dealings when it comes to transfers. So for them to even appeal this lifting of the ban from the January transfer window is, is a bit cheeky. Because I think they should be kind of grateful that it's only a one or one season, a, a two window ban. Because just reading that the small that I read there, I haven't, I haven't read, I haven't read a whole forty-four page document, but just reading that small little summary there, this is planned and executed, not by error. Because if they could have got away with it any longer, they would have. It wasn't a, a slip. Of, oh, sorry, we forgot to register. Let's inform FIFA. No, they were found out. Because it was going on for years. This is, a, this is something that was dating back from to what, 2011. Bertrand Traore said he was he was signed in 2004 and he was playing for three years prior. This thing is dating back years. So Chelsea are lucky. In some ways, because of what they've been found out to be doing, what they're being punished for is allow them to get through this period of um, this suspension. But if I were them, now I don't know how, how the appeal process works because I know sometimes if you appeal and they feel it's frivolous, they can even extend your ban. If I were them, I think, boy, we got off lightly. Take the two window ban, use um, you know our resources from the ill-gotten gains to get through this season. And we go again. Now, Chelsea are going to have to change their approach. How is that going to affect uh, their whole business model? Their approach to young players and first team players and how they get them the, the experience that they need to make at this level. We have to wait and see. Um, but it's going to be definitely be interesting. Are they going to just do away with the, the youth academy in the way that it's going at the moment? Because... Its strength lies in the amount of young people that they have on their books around the different clubs um, in the world. If they're not able to operate in the same way, do they have to scrap it as a whole and, and start from fresh or just change and tweak their approach slightly just to fit with you know FIFA's regulations that most of the clubs are? Welcome to the real world, Chelsea. Welcome to the real world. Guys, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button, share this video, let me know your thoughts. Is the band too harsh or too light for Chelsea? Um, and do you think that this is going to affect Chelsea going forward in terms of their whole model to their youth academy um, and running the club as a whole? Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.